Brilliant. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Live. Today, we've got a very interesting session from an old friend of uh, Monday Night Live, Ava Ferrari from Albuquerque in New Mexico. Welcome, Ava. It's great to uh, have you with us yet again. Let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Ava. For those of you that don't know Ava, she was born in Estonia, uh, which is uh, apparently the least religious country in uh, in Europe or even in the world. I'm not sure about that. Um, married to a US citizen, a lifelong learner, professional speaker and a real estate broker. But she I was very interested in intuition, which is something that I've been very interested in because I always felt my gut feel was often right when logic said perhaps it wasn't right. So welcome, Ava. Tell us all about what you've discovered about intuition. Well, thank you so much, Derek, for having me and good morning and good evening to the rest of you here. Great to be again a part of the show. Well, Derek, I already forgot your question. Tell us all about intuition. Is that what you ask? Yeah, I know that you're fascinated in, in it and you've studied it more than even more than I have on the left and right brain side and gut feel, etc. Tell us what you've discovered. So I think the first and best question to ask is the one that is already in everybody's mind every day anyways. Should we trust our gut feeling or our intuition? And I am pleased to say that over the last 20 years, there's been a massive shift in proving that that notion or that intuition that we feel at times without having any rational thought supporting it. Just to sort of uh, let you know that United States military has started trainings in intuition for their everyday common soldiers because more often than not well actually it's their intuition apparently is always a hundred percent accurate if it is really an intuition which takes us to the uh, really obvious question when is intuition really intuition and when it's something that our mind wants to tell us so scientists sort of are approaching intuition from the point of view of the body. So your physical being, we all know what that is like, don't we? Our physical being is sort of that big pile of bones and we have some meat and skin around it. But this is not only the only part of the human existence. We also have a whole field of energy around us, which the science has now approved or sort of I can't say discovered because you could, can't discover something that has always been there but what the science has also realized that is absolutely existent sometimes you hear people say that well you have the body and then within the body there is energy it's actually the other way around your body sits in the field of energy and your greatest organ or the most energy emitting organ is your heart. Sometimes we think it's the brain, but that's not the case. It's your heart. And what the scientists have figured out, and it was actually in 1991 when it was figured out that at the center of the heart, there are about 40,000 neurons. And those neurons are identical to the same cells we have in our brain. So essentially, we have a small brain within the heart. Isn't that fascinating? And when the scientists initially thought that the brain, our actual head brain or the mind brain is giving commands to the heart brain, which is also sometimes called a small brain, then it turns out that it's not quite like this. It turns out that actually it's the heart brain, that cluster of about 40,000 neurons is giving command to the main brain or the big brain we have in our heads. And coming now back to the energy field that is part of us as well, it's on an average person that energy fields is about six feet away from us. So that would come to about two meters around us. And you can actually measure it. For the longest time we have, uh, you know, I say for the longest time, but I'm pretty sure you 
can bring into your mind the paintings from medieval churches, medieval church paintings, and all the saints have sort of a round halo around their heads. Essentially, they are painting the energetic field or the aura that everybody has. Certain spiritual teachers, they can have their energetic fields hundreds and hundreds of feet around them. Have you ever... Uh, attended an event and when a speaker, a really well-known speaker, or maybe it's a spiritual leader such as Dalai Lama, whose energy field is just massive, they enter the stage and their presence just overtakes their entire room and space. Have you ever experienced that? Mm, mm. Or sometimes a person walks into the room and everybody just notices you know that person entered the room before you actually saw the person being in the room i when i was growing up uh, my family was very friendly with uh, neighbors across the hallway from us and i remember going over there when i knocked on the door and you know you just open the door you your close neighbors i would stick my head in there and i could tell if the mom was home or not wow. you often feel when you walk into a house, is it just the kids home alone or are there any adults in command in that household? So that's what we really feel is that energetic field. And we have that field around us and that field is continuously and constantly communicating with all sorts of energies around us. So layer by layer, our personal energy field gets information from the energy field around us from other people's energy fields and from even objects. We pick up energies from everything around us. And layer by layer, that information does not get relayed into our brain mind, but it goes into the heart mind. So when we talk about intuition and the sort of Western scientists, they talk about it from the mind's perspective mostly. But what we are gonna talk about here today is from the energy perspectives. From now, the Eva, perspective let me, uh, energy let me uh, yes. just run the tape back a minute. How yeah. do you know all this stuff? Why? How have you been studying this? Such uh, a person with so much information and so much knowledge, considering you're really a real, a real estate broker, a mum, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and a speaker, and goodness knows what else. Yes. Where did so this info from? I'll, t I'll take us back to nine years ago. I got really, really sick. And it all started with a common cold. You, you would never think that just a scratchy throat can turn into a life-changing event. But I just got a scratchy throat. And I'm pretty sure everybody here has done the same thing I did at the time. I went ahead and popped an ibuprofen because I had to go to work and I had to take care of the kids. And you know, you pop the pill just to make you feel a little better. And then you hope you, it's going to go away. And sometimes it just doesn't go away because pain demands to be felt. And if you don't pay attention to any signals from your body, the body will make sure that at some point you're going to listen. And let's just fast track this whole ordeal that started with a scratch in the throat four months later. I was in the emergency room and waiting for the emergency uh, emergency surgery to stop uh, the bleeding from my throat. So I had, ha I had had to have a tonsillectomy, which just didn't go so well. And I had what's called a near-death experience. In a nutshell, for me, it was a window or an opening into the world of energy around us as well. We are so focused, especially in the Western civilization, on matter. And it, it comes with one of your own fellow countryman, Derek Arden, Mr. Derek Arden. Uh, Isaac Newton is the one who really introduced the laws of uh, mechanics and the laws of matter. And from that point onward, we have mostly focused on how to care and how to manipulate the physical materialistic world, the world that is made of matter only. And we haven't really paid attention to the energy that is also a part of our human experience. And from that point onwards, I you can't unexperience something you have experienced, right? We often talk in science about the somatic experiences people have. Are they real? Can we take these into considerations? Are they just um, 
hoaxes or parts of our imagination. And we like to give our minds more credit than they actually, than the mind actually deserves. There is a whole realm of what makes up a human being, and it's not just the body and the mind. Did I answer your question, Derek? You yeah, you did. Right. Let's keep let's mm -hmm. let's keep going into the into this fascinating world of uh, mind, body, gut, feel, etc. Yes. So let's come back to the intuition. And it's interesting with the intuition, there, there, are, there are a couple of steps, the way the intuition comes to our body and how we interpret it. So the first step is that we, we experience an inflow of energy and that energy enters the heart space. The step two is that heart space is being now translated into the mind is being transferred that energy is being transferred from the heart space into the mind space and step number three is the mind now interprets what just happened and that's often what we experience as intuition uh, on everyday basis here's uh, and that process from the moment we receive energetic information into the heart space until we start interpreting it interpreting it in our mind it takes from a fraction of a second to about eight seconds. As long as that. You... Say wow. again. As long as that. I thought it, it might... can take up to eight no. seconds for that information be translated. And it depends on now on an individual, how you experience the first step, because the key here is to sort of catch yourself on that first step when the intuitive information is being uh, sort of um, transferred into the heart space or the heart brain or the little brain that is at the center of your heart. Because here's the thing, humans, we humans, we have what's called an ego and our egoic mind, our egoic presence would love to intercept that whole process, how the information is being uploaded from the heart space to the mind space and sort of get their fingers into the pot as well. So how can you actually recognize when it is your ego who is interpreting the information, who's trying to get you to think a certain way, as opposed to when it's an actual piece of information that is coming from the intuitive field, from the energetic field around you. This is the greatest and toughest task for you to know when you can actually trust the information that you take as intuition or sometimes also called your gut feeling. You just know, it's just like you have this knowing, right? Yeah. So let's talk about this one uh, from step point onward because the medical field is looking at it mostly from the step two when our interpretation already starts taking place in our minds. So first off, your intuition is always emotionally neutral. It never adds an emotional charge into it. And uh, emotionally neutral, emotions are attached to the physical realm, to the matter. We have to have a thought and then we have an emotion that is attached to it. And before we formulate the thought, that's when the ego likes to come in and hijack the process and attach a judgment to it. So I'll give an example. Have you ever had an experience when you meet a person and you hear this thought in your head, while well, that person's not a good person? Have you ever had that? I have, so yeah. yes. So most likely you got a and um point of intuition you experienced this Funny and it thing. was uploaded that information went up to your brain space and now the mind started formulating words and thoughts around it because the energy field does not function with words so if you already formulate the specific thought around it and that thought is emotionally charged something has happened here so your intuition does not come in with judgment most likely what you felt was that that person is not for me. Or even better, what came in was step away. Hmm. We like to, it's the ego that loves to pass judgment to other people. 
for example, have you ever met somebody who you consider not a nice person? But for some reason, even that person who you think is not a nice person still has people in their lives who think that that's the best person on the planet. Mm. Or think about some polit political leaders that you don't like. There are people who still vote for them. There are people who propagate for, or you know, speak for them and promote them and push them, right? Yeah. So that there is bad and good in every person. It is not your intuition's way to judge what that person is. That your intuition will only step in to let you know that you need to step away from that person. You don't have any vibrational balance or equilibrium with that person. So does so this you, work, yeah. does this work um, on television when we're looking at political people? Does it work on Zoom when we're we're here, or do we have to be in the real world to get this feeling? It's always, of course, the best if it's the real way, or if you're face to face with these people. It's the easiest. But yes, it works on television screens. It works on Zoom as well, because energy does not have the the mechanical boundaries like the matter does. Energy does not have that. That's why energy healing is possible, even though the healer is across the globe. Mm. We're getting into the realms of um, of the wacky now, aren't we, really? Yes, and we you, are. You yes, and we I are. tease a little bit about, about the wacky, and, and I think everyone on this call is relatively open-minded, but uh, what do the medics say about this? They don't know. So the medical field uh, considers, well, if we just talk about the energetic healing, the medical world will, in the West, will call this spontaneous healing. They will not attribute anything to the energy fields that have been maybe manipulated or changed or altered through such distance. Mm. Mm. Okay. They so don't know what to say about it because Western science requires a specific element of proof and it has to be, somebody has to be able to replicate what just happened or what just happened and oftentimes it, it's impossible with humans because there is a thing called biodiversity every single human body is different that's why what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another person it comes with diet and medication different therapies different experiences that's why for example when we come back to the military the same experience but 90% of the soldiers are just fine. Only 10% will get PTSD after that traumatic event. It's because we are different. Mm. And there is no one way to treat everybody across board. Everybody will behave a little bit differently. I see this in the world of real estate, something or a substance that is very prevalent in mountainous areas is radon, which is the second leading cause of lung cancer in people after smoking. And some people, there's a family of five people living in the house. One person gets lung cancer and the other people are just fine. So we can't make blanket statements when it really comes to people. So when we're negotiating, um, mm -hmm. how do we um, how do we bring this gut feel into uh, our negotiation outcomes? If you're facilitating a negotiation, it's significantly easier because you are in a calmer state of mind. But if you are a party to a negotiation, you need a, a lot of practice. You have to practice, 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 getting in touch with your heart space. And you have to know the difference between when your ego is hijacking the process from when it's actually your intuition, when you actually had a stroke of intuition and you are following that energetic guidance. So the way it's I would not, explain mm -hmm. this, Ava, but this is going back 30 or 40 years, is sort of left left and right brain. And the left brain is when you're into that uh, zone of concentrating and ego. Rational is, thinking. Mm -hmm. Ego involved rational thinking. Whereas if, you're, uh, if your right brain's engaged and you're relaxed and you're watching and you're observing, you're more yeah. in that sort of relaxed state. That seems to be what you're describing, even though left and right brain gets poo-pooed these days a lot of people still talk about it and i think it's uh, very valuable 
yes, it is valuable. And, and the left brain controls the rational thought process. The rational thought process is the part of the brain that tries to put into words what the heart, heart brain is sending into the brain. Yes. They are both important. I don't think that any part of the human existence should be shunned or somehow frowned upon. We have two sides of the brain for a reason. Mm -hmm. But for the longest time, the little brain in the heart, we have completely tried to pretend that it has no validity and has nothing to bring to the table. And it turns out it has more to bring to the table than uh, we ever thought. It, it's kind of the ringleader. I like a quote, and that quote has been wrongly attributed to wrongly attributed to Einstein, but it's really not Einstein's quote, but it's based on sort of his work. And it says that the intuitive mind, it's our heart space, so that sometimes people will just say it's the right brain or right side of the brain, but it's really the little brain in the heart, that that part is a sacred gift. And the rational mind, that left side of the brain that you were just talking about, Eric, is the faithful servant of that heart brain. But we have created the society that honors the servant, the left side of the brain, and has completely forgotten about the gift, the heart space, the heart brain. Now, it's interesting, oh. isn't it? Because, um, you know, there's been a lot of work done on the un unconscious mind through the work of neurolinguistics, et cetera, as well. And uh, brain never goes to sleep, does it? It processes information while we're asleep. And sometimes we wake up at three o'clock in the morning or in the shower or when we're driving to work with the answer to a problem that um, we <laughs> couldn't solve the night before. Is that intuition? Yes. yes, that is, Derek, that is intuition as well. Oh, it's part of the intuition. We need to shut down, and I, I can't say shut down. Let me say a better phrase here. We have to quiet and calm down the rational brain, the left side of the brain, to be able to hear what else is going on in there. We just can't hear because to live in this high stress survival mode society that we have created in the Western world, for the most part, we need our rational brain. It needs to constantly analyze just the, the war or the, the massive wave of information that comes into the brain. And we need to sort through this and make sense of it and survive in that space. And it has to be loud and active. So Derek, when you said that you pose yourself a question and then you get an answer by the morning, that's what it is. The rational brain actually got a break. You shut your eyes. Our senses are not as um, heightened as they are throughout the day. We are not constantly focused on the external world. We actually have the potential to hear what's happening within our inner world, to be in touch with our inner world. And that's how we get the answer. The answer is always already within you. The challenge is we just can't hear it. We can't make sense of the noise that is constantly within us. That's why meditation is always so powerful, Derek. Mm. It is so powerful because it allows us to actually hear the voice of our intuition, our inner voice. Very interesting that, Ava. It's also interesting the word intuition is spelled I N. Tuition, mm -hmm. T-U-I-T-I-O-N, almost as if whoever uh, invented the word knew that inside us we had this uh, tuition. Um, and I was just thinking when you were saying that, you know, anyone that's ever lost their keys or can't find their keys, the more we rush around looking for our keys, um, yeah. we go and sit in an armchair and think, uh, where did we leave them? Often they turn up, don't they? It's really extraordinary. It really is. We're and oftentimes, time. we're nearly out of time. I'm going to ask people to put any questions they've got for you in the chat box. Short, sharp, specific questions would be great. But um, I'll let you just finish off with a few tip top tips for us to actually to actually discover our intuition and get inside of it and use this skill to our yeah. advantage. But so, thank you for that, Derek. Uh, I'll go over it. So first, I touched on the first one very briefly, emotionally neutral. You know that it's intuition because it's emotionally yeah. neutral. Yeah. And it's usually non-verbal. It's a form of energy and it doesn't come from the body. But all of a sudden, you some people hear something in their heads 
it's usually just a snippet of a sentence, just a couple of words. Like I said, I'll give you an example of a woman who was abducted by um, a serial rapist and she had this three second window to escape the space she was held captive in. And her intuition, all her intuition told her, told her was that, go now, just two words. Not that that's a horrible person, he's about to come in and kill you, just two words, go now. And she just stood up and left that space because she had that window of opportunity. So oftentimes our intuition will enter our realm just in a snippet of a couple of words, no emotions, and it's always just the next step. You will not get a download of a 10-step process of how to live your life. That doesn't, that's not intuitive. Intuitive comes from the quantum field. It's just the next energetic moment or step you need to live in. And oftentimes you can physically feel when it's coming in, when you have practiced long enough, you will feel either a, a speeding of the heart rate or the other way around, the heart rate slows down. Sometimes it feels as though the time has slowed down, almost like the whole world skipped a second. Sometimes people get goosebumps, but you usually have some sort of a, an, a physical sense that accompanies that inflow of intuition, something that's important to you. And now you need to stay in your heart space, pay attention to your heartbeat, put your hand on the heart, just to make sure that you are not uh, letting your ego to hijack this whole process. And what about when other people are trying to tell us that we should do it and our gut feel is telling us we shouldn't do it, but we've got this pressure um, we've all bought things that we didn't want to buy because we've had sales pressure or whatever psychological pressure it's been. How, yeah. should, we how should we handle that? I, I think no is a complete sentence. It's okay to say that I, I need more time. It's not a good time for us. And if you feel you don't need to explain something, I think it's okay not to explain things. Mm -hmm. I must admit there's one or two people who are involved in banking or um, or decisions, you know, credit decisions or big decisions where sometimes we felt we shouldn't do it. And the rule always was if you want an answer now, then it's no, because we need to think about it, sleep on it or or or, or whatever. And I was a great believer in sleeping on it. Yeah, well, that's been absolutely fascinating. You've got something else you want to say there. So I don't want to miss anything. So uh, yes. Go on. Derek, I was just going to add that you, you will see that the sales world will put pressure on your intuition and they will say, well, this deal only lasts for another 15 minutes and then it goes away just to overcome that sense in us that I'm being rushed. I don't feel comfortable making this decision because I don't have that inner clarity. We have moved to this world where everything has to be fast and we have to lose weight fast and make money fast, become rich fast and famous fast. That's, that's not how, uh, how, how the human body works in general. Think about it. It takes nine months to just create a teeny tiny version of a human being. And then it takes another 20 years to actually raise an adult or grow into an adult. It takes time. And our decision making when rushed, even in negotiating, it's one of the worst things to do. It's to rush people. It will, at least in real estate, always backfire. Always backfires when people are rushed into decisions. And yet that's what people tend to do, don't we? And that's a negotiating tactic to put uh, mm -hmm. time pressure on people. And there's been some frauds recently where everyone has fallen for the trick of uh, offer ends today, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Ava, that's been really interesting. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I hope you'll come back and do part two for us because I think there's even more that you've got in uh, in your head and uh i'd ask everybody uh members of monday night live to give you the usual round of uh vote of thanks thanks uh, very much ava and great to see you again and uh wow i just I, i'm amazed where you got all that information from but uh, it's brilliant and i'm glad it worked for you over the nine years that <laughs> you've been been uh been working on it thanks very much indeed and catch up with you soon